In this short video, we will look at what effect the microbiome has on weight gain. What causes obesity? Many nutritional experts will tell you that it is a simple equation. You will gain weight if you consume more calories than you burn. All you have to do is eat less or burn more calories. Anyone who has struggled with weight loss will tell you it is not that simple. Losing weight is hard, and most people fail, yet some succeed. Is there more to it than just calories in and calories out? Many will tell you it is their genetics, and they are right that there is a genetic component. There are differences between body types, and this can affect how many calories you burn. Recent research has also pointed to an intriguing idea. Could the microbiome of your gastrointestinal tract play a role. We will begin this video by exploring that idea and then finish by looking at a microbe that is found in almost all humans and the role it plays in human health. There is a very frustrating aspect to weight loss. Any dieter will tell you that while it is possible to lose weight, it is just as much of a challenge to keep it off. Our bodies seem to want to stay at a specific weight, a set point. And anything we do that may deviate from that weight, our physiology fights. There is one insidious exception. If we overeat for a long enough period, our bodies will raise that set point to a new higher number. When a person takes in fewer calories than they burn, they initially lose weight. But after a while, this progress slows. The body misinterprets this weight loss as starvation and begins to conserve energy and burn fewer calories. For most of human history, this mechanism was essential for survival because food was often scarce. But in the modern world, it can be a curse. Once an individual reaches their weight loss goal and goes off the diet, this metabolic conservation continues and they burn fewer calories making it much easier to regain the weight. A recent article in the New York Times provides a stark example of this phenomenon. They followed up with 14 contestants from the Biggest Loser TV show to see how they fared six years later. As you can see, the results are discouraging. 13 of 14 contestants had increased in weight, with three of them weighing more than they did before the contest began. Even worse, their metabolism never recovered, even six years later. All the contestants burned fewer calories each day than before the weight loss. One contestant, Erin Egbert, was successful. Why? She maintained her efforts at weight loss and accepted the handicap of having to deal with a slower metabolism. Erin made a lifestyle change. She didn't start and stop a diet. So this is all fascinating, but what does it have to do with the human microbiome? The human microbiome may have a role in this metabolic change. In 2016, Thais et al. wanted to investigate this weight gain after weight loss phenomenon, but first they needed to find a model system and settled on mice. Can they see the same phenomenon? Let's set the stage. They had two diets, a normal chow diet, NC, that keeps a mouse at a healthy weight, and a high fat diet, HFD, that makes a mouse gain weight and represents a poor typical diet in the US. The mice were split into four groups. NC, that consumed normal chow the entire experiment, HFD, that consumed the HFD, the high fat diet, the whole time. Prime HFD, that started with the NC diet and were exposed to the HFD diet for from seven to 12 weeks. And then finally, psych HFD, that went through two cycles of HFD consumption, zero to four weeks and seven to 12 weeks. The thought was that if you cycle through the diet, this represents the yo-yo dieting that a lot of individuals do that are trying to lose weight. What you can see from the figure is that the psych HFD mice gain weight faster in the second round 
of the high fat diet, even in comparison to the mice eating this diet for the first time, prime HFD, shown in green. The graph on the far right shows that this difference is statistically significant. So yes, they can replicate the results seen in the Biggest Loser contest using mice and this experimental protocol. Further investigation showed that initial weight gain causes a shift in the microbiome. Pictured here is a primary coordinate analysis that statistically represents all the members of each mouse's microbiome and then plots them graphically. You don't really have to understand the underlying statistics. Just know that the closer the points are to each other on these plots, the more similar their microbiomes. Figure B shows all the mouse microbiomes before the experiment began. And as you can see, they are all pretty similar and clustered together. After four weeks, the picture changes. The mice that consume the HFD, Psych HFD and HFD, have a profound shift in their microbiomes. After a subsequent three weeks of dieting, while the weight of the Psych HFD mouse has returned to normal, their microbiomes are now in an intermediate state and did not return to normal. Clearly, the microbiome is changing on a high-fat diet, but does this affect their more rapid weight gain? To answer this question, the experimenters did some fecal gut transplantation experiments. The microbiome of psych HFD mice, those that had gained weight on an HFD diet and then lost it, was collected and transplanted into germ-free mice. As a control, the microbiome of an NC mouse who had never gained weight and ate normal child the entire time was also transplanted into germ-free mice. Germ-free mice receiving the psych HFD microbiome and fed normal child did not gain weight. However, if the germ-free mouse with the psych HFD microbiome was on a high-fat diet, the same rapid weight gain was seen as if the mouse had gone through a weight gain, weight loss cycle. The control NC mouse did not see this enhanced weight gain on either diet. It appears the microbiome is a significant cause of the more rapid weight gain. These effects were not observed in germ-free mice given a microbiome of a normal child mouse, and further investigation showed that the metabolic activity of the microbiome of the psych HFD mice is altering the metabolism of the mouse. Specifically, this was found to involve dietary flavonoids. Dietary flavonoids are found in high amounts in plants and high fat diets are often lacking in these compounds. Counterintuitively, a lack of dietary flavonoids causes a shift towards flavonoid degrading bacteria. More than likely, these microbes do not depend on flavonoids as a nutrient, but instead are growing on the other nutrients in the high fat diet, and they also happen to have the capability to degrade flavonoids. During a shift to a normal child diet, the dietary flavonoids return to normal, but the altered microbiome degrades them. It turns out flavonoids in the diets influence the host's behavior. Other research shows that the presence of flavonoids decreases food intake and increases activity and energy expenditure. In the experiment here, the cycled mice had their flavonoids removed by their microbiome, thus moving less and expending less energy. Can you cure this by feeding the mice with an altered microbiome excess flavonoids? That was the next question. The research performed a test on the effect of flavonoids by including a fifth mouse group. This group went through the Psych HFD protocol, shown in red, but on the second cycle of the HFD, they were given excess flavonoids. When this was done, there was no excess weight gain as seen in the HFD group. Compare the red line in B to the mustard yellow and green lines. And it shows you that the mustard yellow gained weight just as the green the mice that had just first been exposed to the high fat diet. A flavonoid deficit appears to be the whole story. 
As you can see in the graphs E and F, the energy expenditure, which flavonoids are known to influence, is similar to the flavonoid treated group as it is to the controls and is much higher than the cycled group that was not given excess flavonoids. Could the same story be true in humans? Are flavonoids the answer? The biggest loser graph looks a little like the same experiment we saw in the mice. If the research applies to humans, it would mean that weight gain changes the microbiome and weight loss does not change it back. These folks are low in flavonoids and this causes an increase in food intake and a decrease in activity. Is there any evidence to support this? Do obese individuals have a different microbiome? One of the early findings that came out of looking at gut microbiomes of humans was the claim that obese individuals have a different microbiome than non-obese individuals. A major idea was the ratio of bacteroid eats to firmicutes was high in lean people and low in those that were overweight. It was thought that firmicutes are better at degrading complex plant polysaccharides, thus making them available to the host. The microbiome of obese individuals had a microbiome that was allowing them to get more calories from the food that they ate. Several recent analyses call this whole idea into question. Z and Schloss recently examined 10 different studies that compared non-obese to obese individuals and looked at two common metrics that address the similarity of the microbiome between groups. Shannon Diversity Index is a measure of how many species make up your microbiome. The larger the number, the more diverse your microbiome. In previous studies, it was claimed that non-obese individuals had a more diverse microbiome and a more diverse microbiome has been shown to be healthier. However, the data shown here indicate there is no significant difference between obese and non-obese individuals. The researchers also looked at the ratio of bacteroides to firmicutes and again found no difference between groups. This refutation of a popular conclusion demonstrates we still have much to learn about the human microbiome and how to analyze it. What does this say about the mouse studies? Well, different types of analyses were done and more work needs to be done to ferret out if there are detectable differences between obese and non-obese individuals. I now want to switch gears and talk about a microbe discovered to have important effects on humans, Acromantia municipala. Research into the human microbiome is in its infancy, but scientists are already making a few intriguing observations. Almost all humans have Acromantia municipala as a resident of their intestine, as do many other animals. A municipala is about 1% of the total population of the microbiome in humans and specializes in mucin degradation. This relationship appears to be of mutual benefit. Let me explain how. MUC2, the mucin protein, is a dominant protein in the gut mucus. Amonocephyla degrades the mucin protein our body secretes. This protein has sugar added to it as it goes through the export process and it ends up forming a lattice network as part of secreted mucus. It has a relatively firm structure which is altered by amonocephyla by proteolytic cleavage. This cleavage does two things. First, it frees up the mucin to be taken up by Amenocephyla as a source of nutrients. Thus, Amenocephyla is not dependent upon our food intake for survival. Second, it liberates the oligosaccharides in mucin, making them available to the microbiome community. Finally, the advantage for the mammal is twofold. First, the expansion of the mucus by degradation makes it a more substantial protective barrier. Second, some of the mucus is recycled as acetate, butyrate, and propionate that is taken up by epithelial cells and used to power their metabolism. We have also found Acromantia municipiola correlates with good gut health. Patients who have known gut perturbations, such as those observed in Crohn's disease and irritable bowel disease, 
have a much lower percentage of aminosophila in their gut. Studies with mice having a known microbiome indicate that aminosophila impacts the functioning of the immune system and metabolic and signaling pathways. The addition of aminosophila has also been shown to reverse unhealthy effects of a high fat diet. Mice fed a high fat diet often become obese and develop type 2 diabetes. If Acromensia municifila is present as a probiotic in their chow, it mitigates these conditions. From what we know so far, Acromensia municifila seems pretty beneficial to humans. Aminosophila is an early example of what we might learn about our own microbiomes. It may be possible someday to develop gut microbiome transplants that can reverse obesity, type 2 diabetes, or maybe even heart disease. The future is sure to be exciting in this field.